Okay. Am I working? Hi, guys. I'm Lennon. I'm here with an organization called the Dinner Party. We have dinner parties. Um, this is a tofurkey. It is a turkey made of tofu. It is also the last thing that I remember before my life went down a very different path. It was Thanksgiving 2002, and my mom, my brother, my stepdad, and I had gone over to my best friend Emily's house. Emily and I were seniors in high school and had just learned about factory farming, hence the tofurkey. I very distinctly remember my mom telling Emily's parents that she'd just been diagnosed with pneumonia. Two weeks later, her doctors would realize that the persistent cough that they had taken to be pneumonia was in fact stage four lung cancer. Two weeks after that, she would have half of her left lung removed. My mom died my senior year of college. In the course of those four years, I did what most kids do. I stayed really busy and got exceptionally good at avoiding cancer and cancer talk and death and dying. Years later, I met Carla. We had both moved to LA for our musician boyfriends and started working at the same company within the same week. We were walking back from coffee one day when Carla mentioned that her dad had died six months before. Until that moment, loss had only ever been a subject to be avoided. That afternoon, it became something very different, a conversation starter rather than a conversation killer. She invited a group of women who'd all lost parents over for dinner one night, and we talked until 2 a.m. and kept doing it. Friends heard about it, and more friends heard about it, and slowly one table became two tables and five tables. Today, there are more than 70 tables in 27 cities. What was once a source of profound isolation has become a source of profound connectivity. We've had people start tables around pregnancy loss and caregiving and mental illness. And this is that moment where I forget what I'm gonna say. Um, oh, we've teamed up with a group of 16 to 24 year olds, I love this, um, who've started dinner parties via Google Hangout because that to them felt more natural than sit down tables. For most young adults, loss is a source of taboo. We see the deer in headlights looks on the faces of those who've never been there and quickly change the subject. We learn to hold back and to hold in what for many of us has been the most significant event in our lives to date. In short, we learn to hide. We now know that isolation and loneliness can lead to increases in stress levels and everything from depression to sleeplessness to heart disease and a loss in focus and agency. We lose the ability to develop new relationships, which means that isolation often only compounds over time. So take a moment and consider what that means in the context of an education system that is built on labels. Rarely do we even know the first names of our teachers, let alone the stories that brought them to the schoolhouse door. We know students by the statistics that they represent, the product of a zip code or third grade reading score. What if instead of directing our attention outward, we were to direct it inward, to learn about the stories beneath the stereotypes and our own roads traveled, about the fears and challenges that have made us who we are? What would that change? Sarah and Daryl are part of a quiet movement begun in Baltimore in 2004 to fundamentally reinvent the word family. Students join the program after their ninth grade year with an average GPA of 0.8. They are surrounded by a group of volunteers, mostly grad students and undergrads from nearby Johns Hopkins. They pack lunches, they give rides to school, they babysit younger siblings so that their students can study for tests in peace. They do, in short, for their kids what families do for theirs. Why does it work? because they found a way to shift the relationship between volunteers and students from one born of sympathy to one born of empathy. They intentionally define poverty not in terms of economics, but in terms of loneliness. By that definition, all of us know what it is to be poor, just as all of us crave what it is to be rich. Students and volunteers alike are encouraged to share their vulnerabilities and their failures and their sources of loss and isolation. And slowly over time, students whose armor is really strong begins to wear down. They begin to reframe their expectations of those who profess to care and accordingly of themselves. So here's the thing about divided lives. We now know that the more that we try to bury something or shove it under a rug or move on, the more space it actually takes up in our lives. 
by learning to talk about the things that we scrupulously avoid, the things that bind us together, we can actually learn to live better. So if we're to cultivate the next generation of empathic change makers, we have to start by turning schools into centers of authentic community, inviting everyone and everywhere um, to talk about the things that we always hide. Thank you. Oh.